I'm going to speak mainly about our own work at the Cerebra Centre at the University of Birmingham. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, it allows us to tell you um, the latest findings that we have, but also I can talk a bit about the clinical issues that associate to that work, which you may not see in research journals, of course. Um, and what's important, I think, is, the, is not necessarily the specific information about a syndrome. It's the principle. It's the understanding that we, we take from that. Um, in each lecture, um, we, there are resources for you that are online. Um, so down at the bottom is our new website, www.findresources.co.uk. Uh, on this website, we have worked with the syndrome groups, and we have three syndromes covered so far, Angelman's, Cornelia Delang, Cree de Chat. Within the next week or two, we will cover prada Willy, smith McGuinness. Um, sorry, prada Willy, smith McGuinness, Fragile X, uh, Late Summer, Kleefstra Syndrome, and Low Syndrome, and we will continue to add to this. It's mainly about behavior. Uh, and you can find information about assessment. You can interrogate our database. Uh, so you can ask the question, if, uh, how many, what percentage of children aged between 5 and 10 with a particular syndrome show a particular problem? So you, you can interrogate the database and you can look at the results. There are videos of children, uh, for example, using different signing techniques or children in pain so that you can see the signs of pain. Um, there's video of assessment techniques, video of interventions. We also have clinical geneticists, psychologists, uh, GI specialists talking for two or three minutes about a particular issue. So we hope that resource will continue to grow over the years. Um, I don't know if any of you use ResearchGate um, down in the bottom right-hand corner. We're using this increasingly to make available all of our research papers, um, often before or at the time of publication. So these are not hidden behind a publisher paywall. Um, so you do not have to be subscribed to a journal to be able to access the research information that we think you should have immediate access to. So you'll find our, um, all of our papers on there if you search on my name, and you can download those. Um, we've also, with Cerebra, the charity that fund us, uh, we've produced information sheets. Uh, and the three topics today are each covered on those information sheets. These are written uh, parent-friendly, uh, accessible information. There's one on self-injurious behavior, one on autism and genetic disorders, and one on the importance of etiology. And again, you can download those from ResearchGate or from the Cerebra website or from uh, the find website. So that's um, where you can, you can find the further information. So I'm going to speak a bit about um, the importance of, of etiology. And I know this audience will know about that importance, that um, if you know someone has a rare disorder, it helps you understand, helps you predict the behaviors that might be shown and the, the problems that might come with those behaviors. Um, but I think that argument still needs to be made in a, in a broader uh, forum in generic uh, intellectual disability services. And I think in our research um, on behavior, that's our, our, primary, our, our primary interest are the behavioral difficulties. Uh, we'd identify these four dimensions of uh, syndromic difference, if you like, that appear related to behavior. And we just feel the importance of understanding those different dimensions because it helps people understand why we see the behaviors we see. And I'm then going to spend a bit of time on causal pathways, on how we get from gene to behavior, just mention something on interactions between differences, and just emphasize a real need for uh, more work on early intervention. So I'll start with physical difference. So often when we see behavior, if you look at the research literature, it's dominated by a psychological perspective, often taken an applied behavior analytic perspective. 
or an operant learning theory perspective. And this puts forward the view that behaviors are learned, and if we understand the triggers and the rewards, then we can modify those behaviors. For most people, most of the time, that is almost certainly true. But I think what that research has done has to some extent eclipsed the importance of physical difference. Um, and I, I want to emphasize that when we now see uh, people with rare genetic disorders who are showing behavior, particularly behavior that the parents say has just come out of the blue, just started and we, we can't identify triggers, that we start looking for physical difference and we start looking in particular for signs of pain. And I know I mentioned this yesterday, but I just want to emphasize this uh, again. So here, we, we learned a great deal about this um, in people with Cornelia de Lange syndrome. So now there are three, I think four genes identified, all influence the cohesin pathway. Uh, and hence, you can then understand why different uh, causes, different genetic causes give rise to almost the same um, physical and behavioral profile. Um, so it is a rare syndrome, although I suspect the um, prevalence will increase because more and more people are being identified with who are very mildly affected. Um, and, and I think that number will increase. So you will know some of the um, physical phenotype, in particular the limb abnormalities. And I think these allude to one of the mechanisms of the genetic disorder, which is about regulation of growth and development. Uh, and I think, uh, as you'll see as we go through the morning, that may account for um, both some of the physical characteristics. It may also account for some of the um, gastrointestinal disorders that we see, the gut motility problems, but it may also account for uh, very slow development of the frontal lobes that may then give rise to executive function problems. So there's the cognitive phenotype. So that estimate of 11% mild, if you'd have looked 10 or 15 years ago, I think we'd have seen that much lower proportion, and I think that's gradually creeping up. Um, this expressive receptive language discrepancy, well documented in a number of syndromes, smith mcginnis as well, for example. The importance, I think, in this syndrome, when we see the children very early, it's very clear that hearing impairment is giving rise to this discrepancy. And we would strongly encourage the parents to pursue um, hearing assessments and anything one can do to um, ameliorate those hearing problems. Um, and you, the children will often speak late, almost as late, 9, 10. And I think that's because the sensory neural hearing loss starts to be corrected around then, and the middle and inner, inner ear canals are starting to open. So it's really very important, I think, to try and deal with the hearing problems very early on. Some of the interesting aspects of the behavioral phenotypes, um, it used to be that the self-injurious behavior was very, very, very prominent. We've seen this decrease over the last 20 years. I think that's because we've got on top of the GI disorders and they've started to decrease uh, and as a result the self-injury has gone down. Um, now, interestingly, what's prominent in the behavioral profile when we speak to parents is very different and there's concern around the autism spectrum disorder that seems to emerge in the early teenage years, interestingly, late onset, um, and the social anxiety that accompanies that. And I'll speak to that a bit later. So I, 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 I will labor this point, but in Cornelia de Lange syndrome, in the dark bars, this is a percentage of people who have health problems, and a contrast group is in the light bars. And the point here is that the GI disorders, I think, are probably universal. I think it's much higher um, than the right side there, early 80%. It's probably much higher than that. And I think I've yet to meet anyone with Cornelia de Lange who does not have a GI disorder. And that will manifest primarily as reflux uh, and also as constipation. Um, and the most common cause of death in Cornelia de Lange sy syndrome is uh, malrotation um, of the bowel and of the gut. So it's particularly important to keep an eye on these. Just to the left, you'll see the ear uh, problems, dental problems. Again, these are very, very common. So middle ear infection, common in typically developing children, downstream from reflux, 
and also the dental problems, the reflux will cause tooth erosion, erosion of the enamel, then you get tooth pain and, and so on. I often see a lot of sinus pain uh, as well. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of this. So um, just the reflux-related behaviors, we're working on a scale of this now because the real problem is not uh, intervention for the reflux necessarily, which can be done medication with omeprazole or surgery fundoplication. It's the identification that the child has reflux in the first place and should be referred on. And that's a really critical issue, but not just in Cornelia de Lange. I think also in Angelman syndrome with a slightly later onset and even smith mcginnis syndrome quite early on. And, so, and I think these are being missed. And uh, we know GI disorders are very common in people with neurodevelopmental disorders, 50 to 60% of people, but we think these are being missed. Just to take that principle, I'll come back to this on self-injury later on. But so, so studying pain and self-injury in Cornelia de Lange, we then went to another disorder, tuberosclerosis complex, where we knew there would be high levels of pain because of the tumors. Um, and the tumors develop in the brain and kidneys. You often get flank pain, headaches. And again, we showed that if you use, a, one of the scales we use is the non-communicating child pain checklist by Lynn Brew. And again, in tuberosclerosis, we showed that in those children showing self-injury, they have much, much higher pain scores. So the, the principle of pain and self-injury is, uh, I think, applicable across the syndromes. And for us now, uh, as a, uh, for me as a clinician, it's the first thing I look for before I move on to applied behavior analytic principles. Okay, I mentioned this yesterday, but again, I just want to emphasize this, the sleep disorder, for example, in smith mcginnis syndrome. So the point here is, again, this is a physical difference that gives rise to behavioral difficulties. And that in the UK, certainly, uh, one bone of contention or one debate is about whether children with smith mcginnis should be allowed to sleep in the afternoon or not. And, uh, you know, there's a generic rule amongst sleep practitioners, no naps after 11 o'clock in the morning. But actually, in smith mcginnis syndrome, there's a very different um, profile. Uh, and you can see it here. So um, this is... Um, this is typical development, and this is the release of melatonin, uh, which helps sleep onset, sleep maintenance. So it's released around 8, 10 o'clock, peaks around 2 in the morning, and then decreases. And this is melatonin release uh, in smith mcginnis syndrome, and it looks like it's inverted. So it seems to be released in um, early afternoon, but not at night. And this means the whole sleep cycle in smith mcginnis syndrome is often inverted, so the children are very sleepy in the afternoon for very good reason, and they are awake at night. Okay, so I'll just show you. Um, so we, we've been doing some assessments of this, and these, these are very revealing. So we use acti actigraphs, acti watches. So this, is, uh, this just records movement. Uh, and here you can see a child with smith mcginnis This is about 10 o'clock at night, and you can see there lots of movement right through, um, that's about 3 o'clock in the morning. So that's, the, and that's almost, um, almost catches this dip in melatonin in the generic group, as it were, almost perfectly. Um, but what's interesting about this, girls, if you look across the whole week, that's not what you see. Um, she had some good nights of sleep. And I think the smith mcginnis story on sleep has perhaps been overemphasized on the melatonin release. So at the top here, these are patterns of melatonin secretion. So at the top here in typical development, this is around 2, 3 in the morning. Very high. And these are children with smith mcginnis And the first thing you see is individually for these children, the pattern is very, very diverse. So that's typical development. It's all over the place in smith mcginnis syndrome. So I, I don't think we should make the assumption that that's always the case in smith mcginnis You can see at the bottom there, some children are showing what looks like a typical pattern of release, but still the amounts, if you like, are suppressed. 
So I think there's a story in Smith McGinnis about variability in the sleep disorder. And I think what speaks to that is the parent experience of the use of melatonin and the patchy results in the literature. Uh, and just to mention, so we work with uh, Paul Greengrass in, in London. And one of the things that Paul says, which I think is where it's very true when you speak to the parents, is this area, these uh, images come from Peter Hammond, the 3D images to capture the typical face of people with genetic disorders. And what you can see in smith mcginnis syndrome here is there's flattening of the face in, in this area. Uh, and that means that breathing can often be very difficult. So it may well be, and the parents will often report snoring in the children and snore, snore to wake. Uh, so this kind of pattern of um, disordered breathing in the children. And certainly Paul Greengrass has said that sometimes surgery can help um, and then tends to help with the sleep. So I think the story in smith mcginnis is, is quite a complicated one. And it's not just about melatonin. When we spoke to parents, for example, we had 20 parents discussed with them what they thought the causes were very early on. A lot of them cited reflux being worse at night, pain, waking the children. So you've got this complicated um, pattern. So I don't think we should um, just stay, and all biological influences, by the way, but I don't think we should just stay on the melatonin story. I think it's going to be very different. So that's just the, so I think that shows us that when we see a behavior disorder in any child with a rare genetic disorder, one of the first things I will do is make sure that parents and the child has been through um, the right physical assessments. And often the point there is that the parent, for example, is asking for a child with Cornelia Delang syndrome to be seen by a GI specialist. But a pediatrician may be saying, but reflux is very common in young children and it will go away with time. But actually, that's not true in Cornelia Delang syndrome. So often our role has been supporting the parent to seek out those kind of medical assessments. Um, sorry, so the, the second, um, this is really, again, um, been um, sort of eclipsed by a behavioral approach and the, the recognition of emotional difference across, in, in people with intellectual disability anyway. But I, I take this example in particular of emotional difference in people with different syndromes. Uh, and I think this, is, this story's got lost somewhere, but it's very clear that people may have problems regulating their emotions. And I just want to give the example of temper outbursts, which are, are labeled in that way. Um, but I think they're clearly very different to the temper outbursts that you might see in a very young child. So I'll just give this story of um, prader willi syndrome. So what's interesting here is let's take two syndromes, fragile X, prader willi syndrome. In both of those syndromes, we know that people have a real problem with disruption to day-to-day -day routine, that if you disrupt the routine, then people find that difficult. But what's really interesting about that is that in fragile X syndrome, if you interview um, parents, they will report very low, if the response to that interruption in fragile X it is not um, usually a temper outburst or anger and aggression, but it is in prader willi syndrome. So that's just interesting that when you have the same repetitive behavior, the same environmental trigger, you get an, a different emotional response. And then if you ask about anxiety, parents will say, we don't see that in prader willi syndrome, but that's exactly what we see in Fragile X syndrome. And I think this shows us that if one adopted a purely operant learning theory applied behavior analytic perspective, we would not expect a syndromal difference. Uh, and we do. We see a double dissociation in, in one syndrome, high levels of anxiety, no anger. In the other, exactly the opposite. And I think this tells us something about um, different predispositions to experience different emotions in different syndromes. And that seems to me really very important in trying to understand the temper outbursts um, in prader willi or the, the, the predisposition to anxiety in Fragile X syndrome or the reported anxiety. Let me just focus on the 
um, temper outbursts and, and the anger because we've, um, well, it, so this is a, a, it's very important, I think, to try and capture first-hand accounts. So this poster was a young woman with Prader-Willi syndrome describing what happened to her when she experienced these temper outbursts. And, and she was showing her poster, and I was fortunate enough to meet her and discuss the poster with her. And it was the way she spoke about what happened. It's the way she spoke about the way the, the outburst overcame her. It wasn't something she was controlling or driving. It wasn't that she was um, deliberately angry. It was that the emotion absolutely overwhelmed her. And I think that's a really important first-hand description. And then um, this is one of our ClinSID students who interviewed it's around 15, 20 parents and documented the sequence, what happens. And um, the most important thing is what happens at the end. So these, uh, some of these temper tantrums going on for a long time. What happens at the end? Apology, 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 apology. And, and what people were describing was that the, the children and adults with prada Willy were saying, I didn't know what happened. I don't know. I'm really sorry about what happened. And, and then you would say to the parents, are you sure? <laughs> people were really sorry. And they would say, yes. People were upset and ashamed about their behavior. And I think this tells us something about um, at that time, people cannot control their behavior. Um, you speak to parents of children with smith mcginnis syndrome, and they will describe almost exactly the same thing. The same is also true, I think, sometimes in autism spectrum disorder, low syndrome, we're starting to see this and speak to people about this, and septo-optic dysplasia. So there does seem to be, and tuberous sclerosis, interestingly. So it, there does seem to be um, a difference to be drawn between what we might think of as a child's tantrum. I think we have to separate that out from parents use the term meltdown. Um, but it, it, to me, it's, um, it really is a mix of anger and temper. But I do think we have to characterize that that more carefully. But the reason I mention it is that if one adopts a learning theory perspective uh, and rewards behaviors or deals with the consequences, then often that's true for behaviors that are operants, i.e. under people's control, whereas I'm not sure that these temper outbursts are under people's control. And when you speak to parents, um, they will say, the only thing I can do is just leave it let it run its course at that time. Make sure someone's safe, but there's nothing I can do or say at the time that that's running. And this needs investigation. We need to work out uh, ways of managing this. We need to work out ways of offsetting in the future. But it, it, it's troublesome, but I don't think applied behavior analysis is necessarily the, the right way ahead in the first instance. Okay. So I've mentioned... Um, Emotional differences that we might look at in syndromes, physical differences that account for these behavioral outcomes. I'll now just say a bit about cognitive differences. And I mentioned yesterday, I mentioned this example yesterday of rubenstein taby syndrome. Uh, and this work was done by uh, Jane Waite and Laurie Powers in our team. Um, and so uh, deletions or mutations on 16P and 22Q in rubenstein taby syndrome and some of the characteristics that you will know, quite typical facial characteristic and the broad thumbs that um, you'll probably notice. Um, again, this uh, very variable cognitive phenotype, and we've been fortunate to meet some very able people with rubenstein taby syndrome. When I speak later about autism spectrum disorder, I'll describe that a little bit, because it carries a certain different presentation that that's, uh, can be problematic. And one of the things that um, is really troublesome for people is the, some of the repetitive behaviors. And, and, and interestingly, these do not, unlike autism, go alongside any kind of social, necessarily any social impairment. So you can see the triad of impairments fractionating. I mentioned this example yesterday, but I just wanted to emphasize this point about the children with... Um, 
Prader-Willi syndrome can often uh, be repetitively asking questions, asking the same question. And when we looked into this, one of the things we found is that the children perform very poorly on this task. This is a, a cognitive inhibition task. So you have to do what the bear says, the good bear, but do not do what the naughty dragon says. Uh, and children with smith mcginnis uh, sorry, children with rubenstein toby would perform very poorly on this. And interestingly, when you're doing the testing, what the children would do is correct themselves. So they would know that they'd got it wrong, and then they'd correct themselves. But they couldn't inhibit that first response. Alongside that, and this is really interesting, um, the children also have a very poor working memory. And in both cases, the inhibition and the working memory is suppressed relative to mental age. In other words, this is over and above degree of intellectual disability. The cognitive domains are down below what we would expect. And those two cognitive impairments um, correlate very strongly with the repetitive questioning, even after you partial out mental age. Uh, so this is really, we thought this was very important because, um, uh, what, and I, I'll give the example of prada Willie in a second, but what it does is it helps parents and people themselves to understand that this repetitive questioning is not a deliberate behavior. It's not something people are doing to annoy or um, they necessarily have as much control over as they would wish to. It's, it's correlated with having a poor memory and poor inhibition. So as soon as you want to know the answer, you ask the question. You can't put the brakes on at that point. And I think that's an interesting explanation because it then, it then um, locates cause within a particular cognitive impairment. And I just want to show you one other result that we're really excited about in rubenstein toby syndrome. Forgive the rather uninterpretable graph. But this is Jane Waite's work. Um, and what's really important is that in the mouse model of rubenstein toby syndrome, a protein that is related to the transfer of information from short-term to memory, uh, sorry, short-term to long-term memory, is deficient. So in a mouse model, there is a problem in long-term memory. And in rubenstein toby syndrome, there's a really interesting pattern of memory development. So at the top, you can see verbal memory. So this is an animal span task. I give you three names, you repeat them back. This is typical development, so as mental age goes up, so does the number of animals you can remember. A verbal memory, it goes up. The same is true in rubenstein toby syndrome, but there is a, a difference, which is presumably the intellectual disability, if you see what I mean. But nevertheless, it increases. The more able someone is, the more they can remember. Down here, this is the curve for typical development for visual memory the visual me memory. So this is the Corsi block task, where you tap out a number of blocks. But look at the trajectory for typical development, and there is the trajectory for rubenstein toby syndrome. So as people's mental age increase, their, verbal, their visual memory does not. Now this may indicate a highly specific memory problem in, or development of memory in rubenstein toby syndrome. And that may have educational, implications, implications for how we give people inf information, rather than telling them, yeah, do this, then do this, do, do this, actually pictorial cues for that group, and we know this generally, but pictorial cues for that group might be particularly important. So I'll give the example now of prada willi syndrome. So this is a cognitive impairment. It's a bit of a story, but I think it's a, an interesting one. So if you look at repetitive behaviors, one of the interesting things in, um, this is Fragile X Syndrome, 19 different repetitive behaviors. prada Willy, repetitive questioning and adherence to routine in prada Willy Syndrome are really prominent. If you speak to parents, they'll mention the, the um, eating, uh, the impaired satiety and the overeating. But if you talk to them about day-to-day -day behavior, the adherence to routine, the repetitive questioning and the temper outbursts are very prominent for those families, very prominent. 
Now, we, this is how we start to build these causal pathways. Um, so we can divide things up into the, um, the particular uh, genetic disorder. Then we try to map the physical phenotype, cognitive endophenotype, and then the behavioral phenotype. So in correlational studies, these three things seem to hang together. We can show those three things hang together either within the group or in individuals in behavioral sequences. Now, the, the question then is, are they related? Are they, is the insistence, on, uh, the repetitive question and adherence to routine, is it related to a particular cognitive test? Well, this is Kate Woodcock's work, and she's using something called a Simon test. So it's in the lab, and what she asks the children to do is to attend to a stimulus on the screen. And they have to respond either to its shape or its color, and there's a reaction time component. You ask them to respond to shape, and then at some point you say, stop uh, looking at shape, and now respond to color. And when you do that, that's called an attention switching. You've got to switch your attention from one stimulus property to another. If you match children with Prader-Willi with children of typical development, the children with Prader-Willi syndrome are slower. Their reaction time is much, much slower when they're asked to switch. That means there's more load. There's more cognitive load for them when they're switching. They're finding attention switching much, much harder. What was really exciting about this is it's a computer task in the lab, but it correlates very, very strongly with adherence to routine and repetitive questioning, but no other repetitive behaviors. So it looks like it's a cognitive correlate of repetitive questioning, adherence to routine. So the adherence to routine, may what may underlie that is an attention switching problem. So we can now put in the cognitive phenotype because it correlates with these two. And then what Kate did is go back into the lab and she sequenced behaviorally um, some of the behaviors that you see just before a temper outburst. Um, and there's the repetitive questioning. We can show that probability is quite high. But we can also see these. These are important. These are precursor behaviors. So frowning and arguing always pre just preceded a major outburst. Now, it's important clinically because we can see what may just be about to happen. But also ethically, doing the research, we can quantify the precursors without tripping a full-blown temper outburst. What Kate then does is back to the lab, does the computer task, difficult switching, easy switching, and then control difficult and easy tasks. The only time she sees the precursor behaviors is in the difficult switching. So even in the lab, we've now been able to show an association between the nature of the task, not its difficulty, but the nature of the task, task switching, and the behavioral correlate. We were also seeing at that time higher heart rate in children, suggesting this higher level of arousal, perhaps by the increased demand. So then you have to start moving out of the lab. You take it into the child's environment. You invent a game. And what we do is we play the game um, a number of times, and then suddenly we change the rule. And again, when you change the rule, increased heartbeat, precursor behaviors start to spring up. And finally, you go into the child's environment and you walk the same route to school, measure all the behaviors, then you change the route, you change the routine. And again, you see those same behaviors. So what that had done was being able to, to show us now, and this is, I think, the really important bit, is that this sequence is only triggered when there's a particular kind of environmental challenge. It's, so it's the interaction between a specific cognitive domain, problem in that domain, and a particular challenge. And there's, there's a, a, as a clinician there, there's, you've suddenly got a handle on things. You can start to see ways in of trying to help people, and I'll come back to those in a second. But there's a last bit of the story, and it's this. It's can you track from the gene to a physical difference to get to this cognitive endophenotype. And so Kate's work now, um, about 10 children with Prada-Willi syndrome, 
10 typically developing children, functional MRI study, asking children whilst being imaged to do a switching task. And then she records brain activity. And what we'd expect in typical development is frontal parietal activity at that time. That's where switching um, shows activity. And that's what we see in typical development. But in the Prada-Willi group, so this is in typical development, in the Prada-Willi group, you can see that activity in that area is not evident. Now, that's really important for a number of reasons. So you can fill in this last bit. And the important bit is this. When you read descriptions of people with Prada-Willi syndrome, you will often see the terms stubbornness and obstinacy used. And these are very value-laden terms. They imply that people can do something but will not do it. But what this shows us is that interpretation needs to be modified. It's not, I can do that, but I will not. It's that I find that much more difficult than you think I do. <laughs> I can't do that that quickly. And when you do that, you enter the kind of social psychology of attribution theory. So if people attribute intent to a behavior, they are much less likely to help. But if you feel the person cannot control that behavior, you are more likely to help. You are also more optimistic for a future outcome, and you feel more positively about that person. And this is shown in the social psychology literature. So when we give that explanation to teachers, to parents, it shifts attributions, and it changes this from a confrontation to an educational opportunity. How can we help people manage those um, switches? Well, let, let's just look at two clinical implications from this, where we've tried to pursue this work. So one question is, if you, um, if you practice routine for longer, is it more difficult when there's someone changes it? And the answer is, it looks like that. So in this graph, what Leah Bull, PhD student, has done is established a routine for either 10, 20, 40, or 80 minutes, and then she's changed the routine at the end of that time. Now, it's not quite linear, but there is a statistically significant trend showing that if you repeat the routine, then the response to the disruption to the routine is more significant. And the implication may be there, and parents have told us for a number of years, both in Cornelia de Lange, about the insistence on sameness, a lovely poster on the wall out there to look at for that, and in Prada-Willi syndrome, where people, parents have said, when we saw a routine started to develop, we would disrupt it. We would make sure it didn't become established. Now, say to parents, have no routine in your life, <laughs> and they will not welcome this. So you have to have fuzzy routines. You have to fray the edges of routines. We know that we naturally slip into those, but can we make them fuzzy enough such that they don't become highly predictable? And the parents who said, yes, we would often walk that way, but as soon as I saw him really expecting to do that, we'd go a different route, we'd do something else. We'd we wouldn't have the same clothes every day, we wouldn't all sit at the same place. It's easy to say, difficult to do, but this may, and that needs testing, but there may be this kind of implication. Something else we tried, and this again is Leah Ball's work, Kate Woodcock's work, is can you prepare children that when there is about to be an unexpected change, that break in routine that you, you knew wasn't that the bus isn't coming, you have no control over that. Can you prepare the children? So what we did is trials where there was no change, and then we ran trials where we were going to deliberately disrupt a, a routine, but we showed the change card, which is up here, a card the children had never seen before. And you can see a mother here using the card. And what we found over some trials is this is when there is no change. So the kind of outbursts are very low because there's no change going on. This is when um, we did a change with no card, and you can see the outbursts are quite high. And in the middle... Um, it's not always working relative to no change, but actually it is slightly better than the no card. And it was very variable, but some of the children did find this easier. It's almost as if they can prepare themselves 
for what's about to happen. I don't think we're all the way there yet, but some understanding about this and then lifting from some operant techniques has certainly been helpful. Um, so I'll switch now to social difference. So I've shown you the importance of knowing. And, it, and it, in the cognitive differences, it seems to me very important that we go beyond standard IQ tests and start to look at executive function and the different domains. And I know in the States, the NIH toolbox has a number of different um, tests of different cognitive domains where the floor is quite low. And with some of the computerized tests, it should be possible to get the floor low to include those people with more disability. So I'll turn now to social difference um, and why this may be important in behavior. So, so I showed this yesterday, but anyone who works with someone with Angelman syndrome will know that you see very, very high levels, if you like, of social motivation and of sociability. Generally speaking, the children are very socially motivated. Um, and here, you can see that changes a bit with time, but in the under 10s, that's certainly very high compared to these, these other groups. And one of the things that we wanted to know was, if that is true, um, can that help us understand why we see quite high levels of physical aggression in children with Angelman syndrome. So the idea is, is this drive for social attention related to the aggression in Angelman syndrome? So here we do adopt an applied behavior analytic method, and we compare two conditions. A high attention condition, where we're giving attention to the child all of the time, and a low attention condition. In this condition, we turn away and will not give attention to the child unless they show aggression. So it mimics what we think happens in a day-to-day -day basis? And the answer is yes, this works. So what happens is we see most aggression in this condition than this condition for about 60%, 50-60% of children with Angelman syndrome, very different from two other syndromes. So the, the point here, and I showed this yesterday, is that children with Angelman syndrome um, really like eye contact. It, it makes them smile very, very broadly, and it's a very strong drive for them. And if you want to get eye contact, you can do it right now by pulling the hair of the person in front of you. And I guarantee they will turn around and give you eye contact. It's the first thing you do. And so it's a, and hair pulling in Angelman syndrome is one of the most common behaviors. So what you can see there, I think, is an interaction between unusual social motivation in the child and operant learning to drive the behavior. I'll just show you a, a different example about unusual social behavior. And here the syndrome of interest is smith mcginnis syndrome. So in this syndrome, um, there, there's this very high level of sociability. It actually interestingly increases in the um, early adult years, but it's still very high early on compared to other groups. Um, and it's reported in the literature. Um, but there's something rather different about it in smith mcginnis syndrome. And clinically, it's important. And theoretically, it's very important. So one thing is that if you watch children with Down syndrome, children with smith mcginnis syndrome, in a classroom setting, what you find is that the children with smith mcginnis are constantly looking to the adult in the room or um, soliciting attention from the adult in the room, but not the other children. Uh, they are not really interested in their peers. Um, and if you take this a step further, this is a rather complicated experiment, but it, it's really important. This is Lucy Wilde's work, and what she was doing was comparing children with smith mcginnis to children with Down syndrome, interacting with their mother or with her, an unfamiliar researcher. And what the experiment showed, quite a lot of detail, but what it showed was that the children with smith mcginnis syndrome would always seek out their mother, even when they had another adult present. If the other adult was present there for the children with Down syndrome, the child with Down syndrome would attend to the unfamiliar adult. They wouldn't worry about their mother. But the children with smith mcginnis it appears, were very, very strongly attached to their mother. And the importance of this is this is qualitatively different than you would see in typical development. And when parents describe it to me, 
it's clearly very extreme. So the children, as soon as a parent comes home from work, the child would latch on to that parent and will not let them out of their sight. It's a very, very strong attachment. In the school setting, it tends to be one teaching assistant or one teacher, but the child will form a very strong association with that person. And there are difficulties when that person is not available. I'll just show you... Um, so this may be applicable. This is a straight learning theory type intervention. Um, and so we were looking in, in Angelman syndrome, you see a similar problem with this constantly seeking out um, parental attention. And we just asked the question, can we change that? Um, what the parents want, actually, it's very pleasant. The children, it's great. But sometimes you need one hour <laughs> where you can dedicate to the rest of the family. You can do those things that need doing. So this is Mary Heald's PhD work. What she does is, um, down here, you can see she's wearing an orange workman's jacket. It's a bright orange jacket. And when she wears that, she will not respond to the children at all. And when she takes it off, she will respond. And she runs this for around 20 sessions. And uh, that five minutes each. But after 20 sessions, you can see the children, this child with Angelman syndrome, starts not to seek her attention, um, but when the coat is off, she does seek her attention. So that's straight discrimination learning. What the child has been able to do is discriminate between, ah, attention's available, and no, it's not. The jacket is on. I can't um, get any attention. Now, not every parent is going to welcome wearing a bright orange jacket walking around the house. But the point is, you can start to cut this down such that it becomes a small orange badge, for example, or you put on the kitchen door an orange patch. You can fade that over time. So it's just, again, a very simple operant model, but it allows us um, to sort of limit the amount of time that someone may have. I mentioned this yesterday, and this is important. It's about context. So um, when you're dealing with the drive for social contact and the temper outburst in smith McGuinness, you are doing so against the background of significant sleep disorder. and that, So it's much, much harder to deal with that when you are dealing with self-injury in Cornelia de Lange syndrome, for example. And that family context, the in interaction between these problems, I think, is, is really very, very important. We can't just deal with one in isolation. Uh, and that's, that's been one of the problems, I think. I'll just show this other impact on um, parents. So these are data on, the, on depression um, in a number of different syndrome groups, autism, uh, and there's Down syndrome as a point of reference. Um, and here you can see mild, moderate, or severe depression. So smith McGuinness, very high, around 40%. Uh, Cornelia de Lange, Angelman syndrome, all very high. Um, just for a point of reference, this is the levels, similar levels of depression in adults who are experiencing end-stage renal failure or kidney failure. So it's clear that some of these groups the level of family stress is extremely high. And one of the things that we, in all of our research, we keep showing is that the sleep problem is probably absolutely critical in that. So I uh, just want to finish on this, this message, really, about looking to the future. So um, this is a very busy table. It's in a, um article. I'll show this uh, where you can download this. But... What we've been trying to argue is we can identify in the very young children risk markers for future behavior. And if we know that, we can target resources there. So we've tried to quantify these, degree of intellectual disability autism. But the one that is very powerful um, is genetic syndromes. And here you can see relative risk ratios or odds ratios for self-injury. Um, and some of these are additive. So if you also have repetitive stereotype behavior, you add the risk. It, it, it not quite add it, but it, it's accumulative. 
and that seems to be very important. So if we know there are children with Cornelia de Lange and repetitive behavior, they are at very, very high risk for self-injury. If we know that in the, the year, age two or three, there's a window of opportunity there that we should take. So just in summary, those are four important dimensions of difference. I'm sure I've missed out people's syndrome of, of interest, and I've missed out a number of syndromes. But it's the dimensions that cut across that I think are important. Um, we need to be better at the specificity of the difference. So when we talk about sociability in Smith-McGuinness, it's actually um, attachment as an issue rather than generic sociability. Um, some of the repetitive behaviors, it's the specificity, it's not all of them, it's the specificity that it's important and might indicate a different executive function profile. The interactions, I think, are really important to us as clinicians in understanding that a parent dealing with these different behaviors does so in the context of a, a large number of behaviors and their own psychological well-being at that time. And finally, planning ahead. I think early intervention is um, its a very convincing argument on paper. People may want to do the randomized controlled trial that takes 20 years. I don't think we should wait. I think there's enough evidence for us to know the children at risk for these behaviors, the families at risk, and enough um, known about the causes for us to intervene now. Uh, I mentioned the resources, um, and you can find uh, a Cerebra document on the importance of etiology. If you need to make that argument, there's our website. And these are the people back at Birmingham, a really talented, very talented and committed group of students and uh, postdocs who do all the work, and the people who fund us on the left. Many of these are syndrome groups um, who, by raising funds to fund a PhD student, have then been able to tell us what to do in our research. And that's been a really important partnership for us.